I didn't really have a secure place to live. Um, I lived in about eight different homes, and at one point I actually became homeless, and I lived off my ca- in my car off Mulholland. So that was really a lot, and I, I was quite proud, so I didn't want to tell anyone. Skipping forward to 2008, why were you confident that you could become an actor, come to L.A., be in this crazy town full of crazy um, people? I'm quite a fearless kind of person and I always just gamble on myself, I guess. I left home when I was 16 to pursue the arts. I left um, England to come to LA at 23. I watched a, a documentary about Hollywood in the studio system in the 40s when I was about 13 years old and I just thought it looked really magical. Um, just storytelling, you know, I had quite a rough upbringing, you know, being bullied and just a lot of kind of it was hard, you know, and I think I had this life outside of the, the dark situation in movies. That was my escape. And I just kind of thought of Hollywood as just a magical land. And it really is. I mean, there's obviously all the stereotypes about LA exist, but I just wanted to experience it. And I'd never been to America. I saved up money from my last musical theater job, got on the plane, um, and I actually forgot my wallet, which was so stupid. So I arrived in LA with no wallet and my phone didn't work. And uh, this lady, uh, who I actually had never met, came to pick me up and I didn't have a phone and it was just a bit of a nightmare. So it was a bit of a rocky start, let's say, but um, I'm kind of grateful for all the challenges because it made me have um, perseverance and staying power and it makes me appreciate where I am now, having a happy home life and having a good circle of friends. I had to start from scratch when I was 23 and that was kind of, you know, it was challenging, but it was good to push myself out of the comfort zone. Did you have people pulling you back home? Friends, family, Um, life situations? When I first moved to LA, I was quite an an in-demand dancer. That sounds really arrogant, but I was doing a lot of work and I was getting offers of of, uh, jobs still back in the UK. So it was hard. I was pounding the pavements here, trying my best to get work and I was getting offered work back home. So there was a bit of a push and pull um, because I did have an agent and manager here that were getting me opportunities, but I was getting real money offers. So I did kind of go back and forth a little bit. And then after a while they said, you know, you can't, you can't really be doing that if you want to be taken seriously as an actor. You can't be going back and doing these dance jobs that aren't really progressing your career where we want to take you. So I kind of had to make a choice around 27 to really, in a way, you know, um, quit dancing and just take acting full time. What is the typical length of a dancer's career? Um, It really depends on the style of dancing. I mean, ballet is a lot younger. Um, It could be 35. Um, Hip hop and ballroom and stuff, there's a bit more of longevity and then you can go into choreography or teaching. But being a professional dancer, the shelf life is not long. Um, And I I was pretty lucky from 19 to, you know, 27, 28, I did a tremendous amount of fantastic jobs. And I got to see the world, I got to work with pop stars, I got to do musicals, musical movies, and I just had a really great time. But I kind of ticked a lot of my dreams off and then my dreams changed. So then I wanted to be more creative behind the scenes or direct or, you know, there was just a lot of other things that I was interested in. I'm very inquisitive by nature, so. And does that have, a, does that have its own dark side to it or, or uh, it's only positive? <laughs> My inquisitive side definitely has a dark side, which I think is okay because we have a light and dark side and I've embraced sure. both and it makes me a, a deeper perform, a deeper person. It's given me a deeper well to pull from as a, an actor. Um, yeah, no, I think that being lonely in LA when I moved out here and there were some negative influences that um, I uh, had to explore. Sure. I had to work out my demons. Yeah. You know, I came here, my manager told me I had to be straight. Um, I was told, you know, it would lose me roles being gay and I I had to kind of create a facade and a persona and curate a lifestyle. Um, And that was pretty challenging because I had to kind of play a role in my real life. And I think authenticity is is peace, is happiness. Um, And for about three or four or even five years, it was just a lot to keep up. And I think that that led me to a more destructive kind of personal life because I was kind of feeling kind of 
you know, not great in who I was. Um, when your team and people around you don't celebrate you, and it's not necess- it's a kind of old, it's not necessarily their fault, it's the old Hollywood mindset. A lot has changed in the last 10 years. So don't have any bad blood. Um, funny enough, the people that told me I couldn't be gay were gay. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, so yeah, it was, it was a challenge. Um, I had some, luckily I had therapy and I had a good support system of friends and it got me through those harder times. That's what I was wondering is is now it seems like that wouldn't be the case, but maybe I'm wrong. It seems much more acceptable. I think it is. And I think there's it's so much more accepted. Um, but, but, you know, there's still people losing roles because they're gay. Matt Bomer lost out to being Superman. He lost out to Fifty Shades of Grey. And I think it happens all the time. I think there's a lot of actors that are still in the closet because they might lose out on those major roles. Um, you know, living in L.A., we're in a bit of a bubble. Um, But I think we've got to be grateful for the progress that has happened and keep celebrating the people that are brave to come out and be their authentic self. It's a scary thing. I mean, not all actors want people to know their personal life. I'm a very private person and it's quite hard for me to talk about that. But I also think that if I can share my personal experience and inspire others to do the same, even if theirs is different, then that's my goal, to really inspire. Sure, and I know, you know, I'm not, so much up on the tabloids, but I know the British tabloids can be quite invasive in terms of when someone hits a certain level and just it seems like there's just all bets are off and it's it's super destructive. So I could see why somebody would want to keep their personal life to themselves for whatever reason, just to just to preserve their own life. You know? Yeah, I also think as an actor, you want people to not, I don't think it's that interesting to know too much about the actor because I want to believe them in that role. And I think sometimes if you could become too well known as your personality, I mean, look at Jennifer Aniston, she's a fantastic actress, but so many people know her so so well through her personal life that it can be distracting actually, I think. Luckily, I think she's now probably become more private intentionally. But when you're so well known for your your personal life, um, it it can be hard to forget that when you're watching them on screen. Sure, I think, well, I can only speak for myself, but I think when you're younger, maybe you're more open to people knowing more about you, and then as time goes on, there is a destructive element that can come to play. You, you did a movie called Trophy Boy, and I know mm-hmm. I'm skipping ahead, but it sounds like there's some similarities in that, in that, you know, there's a facade that you want the world to see, but there's a destructiveness in trying to keep that up. Right? Yeah, I think that my, I don't want to say gift, but my... One of the themes as a writer director is exploring the onion of taking off the mask and revealing one's true self because that's a journey i've explored many times and i'm very close to that as i just said so it's something that i feel i can share because i've lived it um you know truth is stranger than fiction so i felt compelled seeing the destructive side of social media the mental health uh, how it's affected people's mental health i wanted to kind of showcase the dangers of it in a um, slightly comedic but um, heartfelt way. And I was really proud that the film, I was very nervous making the film because I used a lot of my own social media and I used certain elements of myself. And um, some people actually thought I was Trophy Boy, but I was okay <laughs> with that, you know, whatever. Like as long as you're enjoying the work, then I don't really care. Um, but I intentionally made it a little bit provocative, a little salacious. Um, as you know, you want it to get clicks, you want it to get talked about, but I wanted it to, most of all to have substance and I wanted it to be relatable. And a lot of people that watched Trophy Boy said they either were guilty of some of that or they knew people like that. And um, Trophy Boy was a proof of concept for a television series we're now working on. So we're hopefully gonna explore some of these things in a deeper way on a, a series. So yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'd like to see it. Why were the first two years in Los Angeles difficult for you? Um, I didn't really have a secure place to live. Um, I lived in about eight different homes, and at one point I actually became homeless, and I lived off my ca- in my car off Mulholland, so that was really a lot. And I, I was quite proud, so I didn't want to tell anyone sometimes. So that kind of, yeah, it was really just lonely a lot of the time, a lot of rejection. And I had this steady um, three or four years of working consistently in London, which I kind of gave up for this dream. And, it, you know, it was, it was a bit of a shock. But at the same time, it was exciting. It was, um, you know, I believe LA is a blank canvas and it's what you make of it. And even though it was tough, I kind of 
enjoyed the fact that I was pursuing something. I think it's great to have purpose and go for your dream. And I just had a gut instinct that I just had to stick it out and gradually things got better. So when you would have auditions or whatnot, you would have a cell phone, they could leave a message. It wasn't, I mean, in this day and age, you don't need an answering machine. You can have a cell phone, I guess. So when I first moved to LA, I had the blue book. So we, I mean, it was like kind of nerve wracking. I was just driving around and we didn't have Google Maps on our phones. You know, I didn't have the internet on my phone. I think I might have done, I don't know. But we didn't, you know, I had a, a map, map. So I was like so freaked out by driving on the freeways. I was always late for auditions. Um, but yeah, no, it was, uh, it was, things have really evolved. Now everything's done via tape a lot of the time. It's become a lot easier with Google Maps. <laughs> I, I remember just getting freaked out, getting lost a lot of the time. Like the first year, it was just navigating, just driving around LA was even challenging for me. Sure, sure. There's, you know, like, when the light turns red at an intersection and you're making a left, I didn't realize that there was this like unspoken rule that those three cars could actually make that left. Yeah. You think, okay, it's green for me, I can go, right. So yeah, there's a lot of things that take use to, um, you know, sort of navigating. When did you get your first place? After you lived in your car briefly, what was the first place that you got after that? So I got, I booked a couple of commercials. I started making some money and I got a place on Sunset and Hayworth, 7950 Sunset, and I got my own apartment, which was just amazing. Um, and then um, they got me by saying, oh, it's the first three months rent free. And then, you know, and I was a bit, um, I was a hopeless optimist because I thought that I could survive in that. And I remember then like six months in, the rent was really high, but I made it work. And then I moved to, um, and then I started getting some more jobs here and there. The commercials really kept me going, kept me afloat. And then, um, then I started getting more TV roles and I managed to get a place on Laurel Canyon where I lived for six years. I had six, six magical years in Laurel Canyon. That's when I really feel like I started to really feel grounded in LA. And you're in a magical place where you know there's a history. Yeah. Did that help at all where you felt like I've arrived or you felt like I'm one step from having to leave here? I felt like I'd arrived. Oh, nice. I really did. I think there was something, I felt really at home in Laurel Canyon. There's a mag magical energy there. It's a very artistic kind of community of people. And I finally, I actually started mixing with other producers and I wasn't just acting. I was starting to kind of for, go into like behind the scenes development stuff. And that kind of gave me a bit more control and power, I felt. Um, I just wasn't at the mercy of producers and casting directors. I was actually starting to create some opportunities for myself and that really gave me um, some encouragement that, you know, it wasn't, I could, I could do more than I thought I could. And at any point, uh, once arriving at Laurel Canyon, did you feel any pull to go home? Did anyone try to ask you back? Um, no. <laughs> I've never, uh, there were times I was homesick a little bit, um, but I, I've always kind of managed to go back a couple of times a year to the UK and my mom came out here. Um, my sister has come out here multiple times, um, but I've never been, I've never questioned, even though there's been times that have been tough, like I actually broke my neck, my, I had a minor fracture to my neck in 2016 and oh, I, for six yeah. months I couldn't move my neck, I couldn't work out, I could barely drive. Even though that was going on, I never really questioned my, my journey. I kind of just stuck it out sure. as hard as it was.